Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Lee Klossner. I'm the current RAMS president, and um, joining me here today for this webinar, I've got Dex, Dr. Uh, Alexis pelletier Bui and Dr. Elizabeth Worley, both representatives of CORD and really sort of the experts in the area of communication, you know, our area's applications for residency, especially with regards to signaling programs and how do we use these signals. I know there's been some change in guidance over the use of these signals over the past few years. And one thing we've been asked a lot as a RAMS board here at SAEM is what is the best way for applicants to use these signals and how do I navigate the application in this overall process? So we're really excited here today to have CORE join us and help walk us through some of these questions. Joining me also from the RAMS board is Sarah Schulwolf. She's one of our medical student representatives for currently applying. If ever, all the other panelists want to say hi, introduce yourselves really quickly and we'll get started. I'm Alexis pelletier Bui. Uh, I am the Associate Program Director at Cooper Medical School of Rowan University, Cooper University Hospital. I am also the EM Subspecialty Advisor there, so I have a foot in both realms. Yeah, I'm also a member of the CORD Board of Directors and have sat on many committees through CORD, including the Application Process Improvement Committee, which is how Liz and I have become so intimately involved in everything related to program signaling. With that, I will hand it over to Liz. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us today. I'm Liz Worley. I am the former program director at Penn State Health uh, Hershey Medical Center in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And as Alexis said, we met, well, I've known Alexis for a while now, and I was on several committees as well, but we've really become intimately close through our work together on the Application Process Improvement Committee. And I just ended my tenure in March at CORD's Academic Assembly. I was the chair last year of APIC. So still very much involved, but no longer with nearly as much responsibility other than this stuff. And I'll just say hello as well. My name is Sarah. It's really nice to meet all of you. As Lee said, I am one of the two medical student representatives for the Rams board. I am also a fourth year medical student and MPH candidate at UConn. So this is highly relevant to me. I'm not saying it was a plant, but you know, the timing works out really, really well. So I'm super excited to be here. Super, super appreciative that Dr. Worley and Dr. Uh, Pelletier Bui are going to share their expertise with us. And I think with that, we're just going to briefly summarize uh, the goals and objectives for this webinar. The primary goal is to gain some background on what are signals, where did they come from, and specifically how they've been used not only in this application cycle, but sort of where they came from and what has changed from application cycles past. Goal number two, which I think will be the bulk of the discussion, will be to provide guidance on the use of signaling for this upcoming cycle. And then at the end, we're going to touch on um, some other updates to the ARES application for this 2024-2025 cycle. If you have questions, I Lee can correct me on this. I believe we're going to save them for the end for a Q&A. So write them down. You can send them to myself or to Lee in the chat, and we'll make sure that we get to them at the end. All right, so many of you may not necessarily realize that ARIS performed a major overhaul of their residency application for this past application cycle, the 2023-2024 year. The prior version was in use for more than 20 years. It's what I used when I applied to residency many moons ago. So a lot has changed in this time frame. A new application brought changes to the experiences section. And it added in the ability to note geographic preferences and then also program signaling, which will be the bulk of what we discussed today. So we're briefly going to cover some of the changes in the other sections and then focus primarily on signaling. Now, Alexis and I know this information because we've been working on it for years now, but signaling is still probably a relatively new concept to you as applicants. So we're going to recap some background information on signaling and then share some data from the program signaling experience this past year. So what exactly is program signaling? It's been in the House of Medicine for several years now, uh, but for those of you unfamiliar with the concept, it essentially permits an applicant the opportunity to communicate genuine interest to select employers, in this case, residency programs. This communication in the past took various forms over the years, such as cold calls to programs or their coordinators, love letter emails to program leadership, faculty calling on behalf of the applicants, and so on. And those approaches were often low yield. They could also be sometimes overwhelming to programs and, you know, it just didn't generate the intended effect. With the addition of program signaling, this communication is actually built into the signal itself. 
And so it gives programs the ability to focus on applicants that are highly interested in their programs at the time of application. So they're potentially high yield applicants that may generate slightly more intense review of their applications. Now, we do want to point out that signals are only intended to be used by programs during the application review phase. Programs will only know if their program is signaled. If an applicant does not send a signal, or if they choose not to participate in signaling, no information is going to be displayed, so the program will actually just see a blank space. Unlike the geographic preferences section, which we'll touch on later, there's no way for applicants to necessarily explain the why behind their signal. Now, this part is a little tricky and we want to pay close attention. During the interview, programs are permitted to ask questions about the signal to an applicant, such as, why did you signal our program? But the converse is not true. Programs cannot ask applicants why they were not signaled, or they cannot ask an applicant where else they may have signaled, nor can programs disclose the identity of a signaling applicant to any other program. So as signaling has evolved, specialties have taken various approaches over the years. Smaller numbers of signals, you might see other programs or specialties doing a larger number of signals, and we've even seen tiered signals. The number of signals in the approach varies by specialty, so we need you to please follow your EM-specific guidance and not necessarily what classmates may be telling you because they may be applying to other specialties. We've been following the data very closely as a specialty for these various approaches to see which model will prove the most beneficial for our specialty, for both the programs and our applicants. As a specialty, we changed our approach a bit from last application cycle to this current application cycle. So please ensure again that you are following current recommendations for the 2025 cycle and not necessarily interview or application advice from people who applied previously. Our recommendations are highlighted here. We are going with five signals and we are telling applicants not to signal home or away rotations because they're typically very high yield in terms of interview offers. And you'll see this again later in the presentation, but the QR code here will take you to our own EM-specific guidance on the CORD website. And just so you know, across all specialties, and in particular emergency medicine, the majority of applicants are using almost all of their signals. So it's to your advantage. All right. So I'm definitely going to reiterate some of the things that Liz said, because this is really important for you to understand. As she said, things have been changing very quickly from year to year. So for your signals, you only get five this year. Last year, applicants received seven signals. The reason why we have gone back to five is because our guidance has gone back to our original approach with regard to home signaling home and away. So when we first started signaling two years ago, we said, do not signal your home and away institutions, you get five signals. And the reason why we decided that is because your home and away institutions are typically very high yield in terms of getting an interview offer. And so we did not want applicants wasting their signals on those two, on your home and your away. Last year, the AAMC changed their guidance and they wanted every applicant to signal their top most interested pro programs that they're most interested in, regardless of home or away status. And they were trying to do this for equity reasons for those who maybe did not have a home institution. And so because we previously considered home and away like two freebies because you weren't signaling those before, we went up to seven signals and went with the AAMC guidance of yes, signal home and away if they're in your top seven. This led to a ton of confusion for our applicants. Because again, in, at least in emergency medicine, your home and away institutions are typically high yield for getting an interview. And applicants were getting mixed messages from national guidance, from CORD, and from the actual programs itself. Because of that, we have decided to go back to our original approach, go to this simple approach of five signals, do not signal home and away. This is different from all other specialties in EM where the AAMC is still, double AMC is still recommending to signal home and away. So please, 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 just be aware of that. And if your like advisor at school who is not EM specific, you know, tells you to signal home away, that is not the guidance for EM. And I believe that that has now been updated in the AMC too. When you go to put in your signals, I had a uh, student tell me actually last night that they want they wanted to send our program a signal and they were rotating with us and they got the guidance that they should not be doing that. So um, hopefully it will be clear when you log in, but do not signal home away. 
each signal holds equal weight. So we are not participating in the tiered gold, silver signaling, just one weight. And you can only get one signal per program. So you can put all your eggs in one basket, say, this is my top program. I'm sending five signals there, only one per program. Ultimately, the golden rule, though, is just signal on programs from which you are truly interested. Now, we will talk about some strategies, but always come back to this. Only signal a place that you're actually interested in. You don't want to game the system to the point that it's your, at your disadvantage. All right. So what was some of the applicant feedback over this past year? So 90% of applicants uh, in emergency medicine said that their signals did reflect their true preferences. And about 80% felt that those signals helped them to be noticed by the programs at which they were most interested. So when we are looking at top factors in how an applicant chose to assign their signals, geographic location was really the top. And that is time and time again, always a top response for where applicants are choosing to apply, choosing to rank and ultimately go because being close to family and friends, which is a close second, is extremely important. Perceived goodness of fit, program strengths aligning with career interests were also ranked pretty highly as far as top factors when choosing signals. And perceived chance of interview offer kind of came in at 36%. So obviously there is some strategy here um, and whether or not, you know, you think you're going to get an interview or whether it's going to increase your chances um, does come into play here. When asked, you know, what was their strategy as far as safety programs, reach programs or a mix, the majority did say that they used a mix of less and more competitive programs, about 66%, though there were a couple different strategies that applicants did use, whether all safety or all reach. And advisors, on the other hand, though, more of them were recommending a mix of less and more competitive, so 90%. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that strategy. So what did the programs see from the signaling side? So this graph here is showing you the number of applicants on your y-axis. Each individual program is represented by an individual bar on the x-axis. And so in light blue, you're seeing the number of applicants to each individual program. In dark blue, you're seeing the number of program signals received by each individual program. So the mean number of program signals received was 101 for this past year with seven signals. The range was a minimum of 15 signals received. Max was 333. So obviously a pretty large variation here. When you then graph the number of applications that came with an associated signal, that mean can that was 13%. You can see this in the lower graph here. The range was 4 to 33%. So as you can imagine, somebody who had 4% of their applications come with an associated signal might utilize that signal differently than somebody who had 33% of their applications come with an associated signal. And actually, the Court Application Process Improvement Committee did perform a survey of program directors to see, based on the number of signals that they received, that did that differ in how they utilize those signals. That is to be published next month, but preliminary data, we can say that those programs that received a smaller proportion of signals did tend to offer more interviews or offer interviews to all those who signaled some of those programs versus those who received a ton of signals were more likely to use the signal as a filter or to help them prioritize their wait list. So certainly being used uh, differently depending on kind of the competitiveness of the program and how many signals are receiving. We've also looked at you know, is there a high concentration of signals in a small number of programs? So the top 27 programs, so that's the top 10% of programs that receive the most amount of signals, they receive 23% of all signals. So this is one of the disadvantages with the smaller signaling approach. There is a smaller number of programs that receive a higher number of signals, but we'll kind of talk about why we still think the smaller approach is good for applicants, which we'll see in the coming slides. And also of note, these numbers are pretty similar to other specialties with similar signaling approach with small signals. So this is kind of the money graph here and the reason why we're sticking with the small signal approach. So you can see the data from the 2023 match on the left and the most recent match 2024 on the right. In red, you see the interview yield or the signal to interview conversion rate for those who did not send a signal. So you see that that yield is still decently high. So these are box and whisker plots. The way to interpret it is the horizontal line in the middle of each box is about the, is the median. Your 25th percentile is the bottom of the box, 75th percentile is top of the box. 
bottom of the whiskers, 10th percentile, top of the whiskers, 90th percentile. So the median signal to interview conversion rate without a signal was anywhere between 25, 35% for both years. If you look at those specialties that have a larger signaling approach, like orthopedics with 30 signals, that number is essentially zero. And we have chosen to stick with a small approach because we want those applicants who don't signal to still get interviews at places where they may still be a good match. And so, so that's one key takeaway here. But I think the other key takeaway is clearly the signal helps. So if you're sending it to those places that you're really interested in, that nearly doubles your chance of getting an interview. So signals are useful and in really increasing your visibility. Your chances go from around 35 to around 65% chance of getting an interview. But clearly sending a signal does not guarantee an interview. It's just one part of the total application. When you look at that data broken down by applicant status, we get a, a little bit of a different picture. So if you look, when I say applicant status, I'm, I mean applicant subtype, excuse me. So MD, DO, IMG. So for our MDs, your chances of a interviewer interview conversion rates with the signal are around 45 to 50% without a signal. And it goes up to nearly 80% with the signal. So pretty high chance with the signal that you're going to get an interview. The osteopathic numbers are pretty similar, a little bit lower with not sending a signal, but you know, pretty similar again. With that box being very tall, you can see that there's a large variability though in how the programs are utilizing the signal for these different applicant types with a shorter box. If there's very similar practice between programs with a tall box, it means that programs are kind of utilizing these signals in different ways. Rates are lower though for IMGs. So without a signal, chances are around 5% with a signal 15%. Uh, if you do want to see more data surrounding this, specifically how EM relates to other specialties, you can see that through this QR code. All right. And so the last piece of data that we want to cover with signaling, well, not the last one, but one of the, one of the uh, nearly last ones is in-state versus out-of-state status. So this data, unfortunately, is two years old. We still don't have data for this past application cycle. But the AAMC did look at what was interview yield with and without a signal based on whether an applicant's hometown was in the same state as that residency program or out of state from that residency program. So on the left, you see out-of-state applicants. On the right, in-state applicants. In green is no, no signal sent. Blue is a signal is sent. And essentially, you can see that for an in-state applicant, your chances of getting an interview offer without sending a signal is pretty similar to those of sending a signal if you're an out-of-state applicant. So what does that tell me? So your yield is already pretty darn high if you're an in-state applicant at getting an interview without a signal. Now, does the signal still help you in both instances? Absolutely. And so if this is like your top program, I would still send the signal and really maximize chances of getting your interview there. However, if you are down to two programs that you like equally, and one of those is in-state to your hometown and one is out-of-state, your highest yield will likely be at sending the signal at the out-of-state program because your chances of getting an interview at an in-state program are already pretty high. All right, so let's talk about some of the program signaling rules and guidance that are given to programs themselves. So when programs sign up to participate in program signaling, as Liz said, they promise that they are not going to disclose the identification of signaling applicants. They are not going to ask applicants if they participated in signaling and where they sent signals, with the exception of if you sent a signal to that individual program, they can ask you why. They're not going to ask you if you participated in geographic preferences and where you sent those signals preferences. They're not going to ask you why you didn't signal, why you didn't use this geographic division. And they're really not supposed to be using signals in rank order list preparation or in development of their preference list for SOAP. That being said, we do have some data, both from the AAMC and from Cord APIC, that suggests there are some programs that are utilizing this information when making their rank order list. It is a small number. It's around 10 to 15% that are admitting that they're using it. However, it is being done. So that is something that you should be aware of when you are choosing your signals. 
As far as guidance on use, we again have reiterated time and time again to programs is really only to be used in application review and initial interview offer. It should be used as a plus factor, just one piece of a whole picture. So it shouldn't be offering interviews to everybody who signals, should be looking at other things that make that applicant a good fit for your program. Should not be using it to screen out applicants or over interpret if there is no signal. So we know that there's a lot of strategy that goes into why you are choosing your signals. And so we have told program directors that, you know, maybe you're an in-state program, there's already high yield and they are interested in your program, but maybe want to utilize that signal elsewhere because of strategy. So just don't over-interpret if there's no signal there. No signal does not mean no interest. Always assume preferences as genuine and be transparent on signal usage. So we do ask that programs put on their websites, how they're going to utilize signals. So this is a very common question. How do I approach how I'm going to allocate my signals? So what I tell my applicants is make your top 10 list, your dream list, top 10 programs, where you would love to go. From there, you should really be doing your research. So use Emra Match. If you're not familiar with that tool, just Google it. It's for free, even if you're not an Emra member. You can use Texas Star if your medical school participates in that. And you can use the AMC Residency Explorer tool, which was just revamped and just launched yesterday. And I was playing around with it. It's actually pretty darn cool. So use these tools, research programs using these tools. And if there's anybody that is an unrealistic match on that top 10 list, you should just remove them from that point because the signal is not going to get to an interview if you're not otherwise going to be considered. For example, you know, if that program says they don't consider somebody who failed their step scores or COMLEX scores, and you did, that signal is not going to change anything. So don't send a signal there. If it looks like that program has never had an IMG applicant, do not send a signal there. It is not going to increase your chances. It'll be zero to zero. So really only use those signals where your chance of an interview is not zero. So after you've removed that, if you still have more than five, try to consider the competitiveness of programs. Now, Previously, I think this was really impossible for us to tell, but now with the AMC Residency Explorer tool, you can actually see how many applications each individual program receives, which I think is huge. So if you compare those programs and see that one gets a ton of applications and one not as much, you can probably depend on using that signal for the less competitive program to really increase your yield. That is a general rule. Now, if you're a really competitive applicant, that kind of changes everything for me. I say use all of your signals at your top programs because for those programs where they're using the signal to determine wait order lists, to screen out applicants, then Go for gold and use all of your signals at those competitive programs. But you should really be speaking with an advisor to determine your competitiveness before you kind of go with that approach. All right. Heading it over to Liz for geo preferences. And then we'll have questions about these two sections after that. All right. Thanks, Alexis. And geo preferences is kind of its own way of communicating interest in a certain region. So it kind of is like a cousin of signaling in some respect. And I will explain why this is perhaps one of my favorite additions to the application uh, momentarily. Now, fortunately, this part hasn't really changed for this current 2025 application cycle. So we're just really going to review how it works in general. You can see here that the country was broken down into nine U.S. Census divisions and applicants can choose up to three of those divisions with the distribution here as shown. And then they get to write a short answer of about 300 characters describing each divisional preference. So just like I said, in, in program signals, the applicant doesn't get to explain why. Here they can. So if you are an applicant where you grew up on the West Coast, you went to college on the West Coast, you went to medical school on the West Coast, and suddenly you have a geographic preference for the East Coast, now you can explain why. And sometimes that may be evident on your application. In the past, it really wasn't. But if you can say, oh, well, my partner's family is spread in spread throughout the mid-Atlantic region and we want to be close to their family, aha, now it clicks to a program that they have a reason to be applying to the mid-Atlantic region. I give that example because that's where I'm located. And that has come up in the past, whereas in the past, programs have been left guessing. So my favorite reason is that the applicants actually get to explain the reasoning behind it. Now, 
If applicants don't use a geographic preference, they can either choose to leave the question blank or they can also choose no geographic preference and explain that reasoning as well. So it may be something like, I wanna be a toxicologist and I wanna train at a program that's strong in toxicology anywhere in the country. Great, that makes sense. Applicants also have the ability to describe a geographic setting. So whether that's rural, suburban or urban along that spectrum, or again, they can choose no preference and then they get another 300 character answer to explain the reasoning for that preference or lack of preference. So similarly, Lee, we showed you what signaling looked like for programs. Now we're going to show you here what the geographic preferences look like for programs. Applicants, if they send or if they choose a geographic division in which a program is located, a program will see a yes or some acknowledgement of that geographic preference, and then they get to see the applicant's short answer. If an applicant chooses that they do not have a division preference, then they see commentary that there is no preference. And then they also get to see the short answer explaining that reasoning why. And then if an applicant chooses a geographic division in which that program is not located. So if I apply to Alexis's program, but I do not choose the mid-Atlantic region where she's located, her program will see a blank space. But also, if an applicant skips the question altogether, it will also be a blank space. Now, when considering geographic preferences, applicants, you know, just like we commented with signaling strategy, applicants are primarily choosing geographic locations that are close to family and friends, almost 90%. And then again, location, 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 just like in real estate, 75% were choosing the location of the desired programs. Kind of middle of the pack, around 50% applicants were considering lifestyle factors and also having a previous tie to the region. And then just under 40% were showing interest in geographic divisions based on future opportunities to practice in that area. So this past year, the large majority of EM applicants, about 80%, selected at least one or more geographic preference. Uh, just over 60% utilized all three geographic preferences. 17% noted no geographic preference and 3% we don't have any data. Either they skipped it or they just missed it somehow. But if you go to either of the QR codes here, you can find more data on geographic and setting preference data. So we're going to break it down a little more for you. If you want to get a little more granular, we are looking at the three different applicant types. So allopathic, osteopathic, and IMG applicants. First, we want to point out Allopathic applicants were the most likely to use all three different geographic preferences at 66%. But you can see it was pretty closely um, followed up by uh, osteopathic and IMG applicants at 63 and 55%. Osteopathic applicants were the least likely to choose no preference at only 9%, followed by the allopathic applicants at 13%. But this is in, in pretty stark contrast to almost double or triple the IMG applicant cohort, who 29% chose no geographic preference. And now we're going to look at the settings. Regarding setting preference, just over half of all EM applicants, 56% overall, selected no preference for a setting. For those that did have a preference, suburban slash urban was the most commonly selected at 29%. Urban alone was at 8%, and suburban or rural alone was at 4%. And then Choosing a pure suburban or a pure rural location represented only 0 to 1% of all applicants and 0 to 1% of allopathic, osteopathic, and IMG applicants. If you want to look at it a little closer here, allopathic applicants were more likely to report having a preference for a suburban or urban setting at 35%, followed closely by 33% of osteopathic applicants, and then IMGs were about half that value. You can see in the, the medium blue, about 18%. Osteopathic applicants uh, had a greater preference for a rural or suburban setting at 7%. So still a pretty small number, followed by 5% of IMG applicants and 2% of allopathic applicants. IMG applicants were the most likely to choose no setting preference at 68%, although it's worth noting that about half of the allopathic and osteopathic applicants also had no preference at 47 and 52% respectively. So we know that adjoining states or certain regions often attract a similar applicant pool. 
And it doesn't always necessarily make sense when they're in separate divisions. We also know that the distribution of programs in the various divisions is fairly unbalanced. We did give this feedback to the AAMC, which they acknowledged about the census divisions, but for the foreseeable future, the census divisions are going to remain the same. We've said it before last year, earlier this year, we had to start somewhere, essentially. And I don't think that there's going to be one solution that pleases every program or every specialty or every applicant. But we're going to continue to give the AAMC feedback about the challenges of the geographic U.S. Census divisions as they currently are. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how geographic preferences and program signals work when we look at them together. So this doesn't necessarily include all programs, and but it does represent about 82% of all EM programs. And the reason that we're missing some data is that not every program participated in signaling and not every program documented interview offers in PDWS, which is the program version of ARIS, or in Thalamus. And then there are a handful of programs that did not necessarily meet statistical inclusion criteria. But overall, it's still a really robust data set with 82% of programs worth of data. So we're going to break it down and we're going to start at the top with the dark blue line. And that represents those applicants who sent a program signal. So if you look at the number on the left, 39%, that's the median predicted probability of being offered an interview if an applicant signaled, but the geographic preference did not align. So they did not have a geographic preference for the region in which that program was, but it was a program that they signaled. That value changed minimally at 41%. If an applicant signaled but noted no geographic preference, but there was a significant increase up to 61% if an applicant signaled a program and also had a geographic preference for the region in which that program was located. So that's not quite double increase in likelihood of getting an interview offer. In comparison, if you look at the bottom or the lighter blue line, this represents applicants who did not send a signal. So a general application. The median pr predicted probability of being offered an interview was 18% if there was no geographic preference and no signal, and also about 18% if the geographic preference did not align and you did not send them a signal. This value increased to 35% if the applicant's geographic preference aligned with the program's location. So just having a geographic preference for a region will increase your likelihood of getting an interview offer. So we're going to simplify this even more. Program signal plus geographic preference is greater than 60% median predicted probability of being offered an interview. Program signal alone, so a non-aligned geographic preference or no geo preference, still has about a 40% predicted probability of being offered an interview. And then no signal but a positive geo preference that aligns with a program's location is about 35% median predicted probability of getting an interview offer. And if there's no signal and no geographic preference or no signal and a misaligned or non-aligned geographic preference, it's just under 20% probability of being offered an interview. So these applicants are still getting offers, just not at the rate of those with geo prefs and or signaling. Yeah, I do want to jump in here as well and comment that um, when Liz and I first saw this data, we were actually just given this data a week or two ago, that I was quite surprised because I think that the no geo preference should really be more similar to the geo preference aligned than the geo preference not aligned. So I think there's a couple issues here. Um, I think one of it is realignment of program expectation and education as to what no geo preference truly means that, and we have since communicated with our leadership that that is still a high yield applicant. That is somebody who is willing to go anywhere and they're really looking for a program that's the best fit versus those who have a geo preference, but is just not aligned with that program. Like that is a lower yield applicant. So hopefully our programs will be seeing this a little bit differently moving forward. But this also changes how I'm now advising my students. Because before, if 
an applicant show me their entire list. And if all of their programs fell into three distinct geographic regions, then I would, I told them to align or to choose those three geographic reasons, regions for preference. If they had any that fell out of those three geo uh, regions, I said, put no preference because it seems like you have no preference. My guidance is going to change. I'm going to tell applicants, at least for this upcoming year, that they should really choose those three geo preferences that had the most amount of programs to really increase their chances of getting an interview because unfortunately it looks like that also makes a difference and choosing no geo preference could be at a disadvantage for you. And then one other thing that I wanted to cover before we get into the Q&A that I don't think we did when we were talking about geographic preferences, but it is a question that I get a lot. You can choose an essay for each individual region that you choose. So you choose three individual regions and you can have a different essay for each one. And the program is only going to see the essay explanation for the region at which that program is in. So if they say Mid-Atlantic, is one of their regions and I'm in the middle Atlantic region, I'm only going to see the explanation for that one. I won't see that that applicant had two other preferences as well and what those preferences are. And now I think we have some time for Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much so far. This has been really informative. I'm just going to read out there have been a couple of questions in the chat. The first I think you may have already answered from Dante that says, if you use geo preferences and add three regions, do programs within one region see that you had a preference for the other two regions as well? So programs only see information about the geographic region in which they're located. So if I have a geographic preference for the mid-Atlantic region, and then like two other, one in the Midwest and one in the West Coast, and I apply to Alexis's program, she will only see the mid-Atlantic preference. And if I have no preference and I choose no preference, she will see that I have no preference. Or if I choose three programs or three geographic regions that are outside of the Mid-Atlantic, Alexis will see nothing. And then I think that kind of like leads into the next question and that all just like signaling, the geographic preferences are all of equal weight. There's no rank to them or anything like that because no one else will know that information other than you. Awesome. Looks like we have a couple more questions in the chat. I think you covered the first two. Uh, one from Lucinda says, since most IMGs do not put a geo preference, would you recommend going that route and not listing a geo preference for IMG applicants? If IMGs do list a geo preference, could this hurt them since that doesn't seem to be what most IMGs are doing? I would say based on the data that we have now, I would, if you have a preference, I would put what the preference is because I think that's going to increase your interview yield versus choosing no preference. I think, you know, IMGs were choosing no preference to show that they're flexible before, but now that we have data that your yield is higher when you choose an actual preference, use the strategy that gets you those interviews. Awesome. Next question is from Yanni. He says, I know that Cord recommends not signaling to sites we've rotated at but does that also apply to array rotations whose start dates are after ARES applications are submitted? Or because those rotations take place later, should we still signal those programs if they're a top choice? I think this one is a little bit iffy. I would probably still lean towards not signaling, but I would communicate with the program leadership at that institution. And I think this also applies to EM subspecialty rotations. So previously, two years ago, our original guidance was like, T rotations are kind of a big question mark because they aren't necessarily as high yield for an interview automatically as a traditional EM rotation. So I think for both both of those instances where your rotation is a little bit later and the program leadership may not be aware that you rotated just yet, or you had a subspecialty EM rotation, say like ultrasound, toxicology, pediatric emergency medicine, where maybe you have not interacted as much with program leadership or core EM, in fact, like clerkship directors, et cetera, just reach out to those programs and inquire about what their expectations are about signaling for those institutions. And our guidance for home and away rotations for core rotations is pretty clear, but we ask those programs to be transparent about those subspecialty rotations. Awesome. The next question is, do you have any recommendations for including versus not including hometowns? How do programs outside of your hometowns use this tool? And I think you did touch on this briefly. 
So I, I include, so a change that if we had time, we're going to talk about is that the hometowns, the number that you can list decreased from five to three, because people just the way that it was reported in the new changes with Eris, it used to be a free text box and now they made it through like distinct elements. So they found that people were trying to fill those five boxes and including a lot more hometowns that weren't truly hometowns. They decreased that to three programs in general. They know that you want to be somewhere where you have ties and geo preferences are really important. And so we view those applicants as high yield. I think it is helpful if those hometowns are close to where you're applying. And I don't think it's going to hurt you in any way if you're applying to programs that are outside of where your hometown is, especially now that you have the option to include your geo preferences and your program signals. So you have other ways to communicate your interests. So it's not going to hurt to put the hometowns. I think it can only help. Yeah, I, I've never heard of a program excluding an applicant because of a hometown being listed or not listed on an application. It's just a very more obscure and tiny piece of data. And there are many more important things on the application that we consider strongly over hometown location. I'm going to jump ahead to this question because it also touches on hometowns, which is if a top choice program is in our hometown, but there are a few other programs in that geo region we plan on applying to. Would it be recommended to use a geo preference on the hometown region or to save that preference for a region with more programs? I would not try to game the system. If you are truly interested in that geo region, put that preference there. Because again, we are seeing that with that geo preference aligning, that is going to increase your chances. I would not do anything to decrease your chances at the places where you're truly most interested. Don't game the system in that way. <laughs> Always stick with the golden rule of your most interested places first. If there's any gray or tiebreakers, then I think you can bring in strategy, but I would go with choosing that geographic area. I think we have two more. Does choosing no preference for setting increase your chances of getting an interview? Long story <laughs> short, no. Over half of the EM applicants last year did not have a preference for setting. So I really don't think it matters as much. Now, the one area where we have seen a small increase in interview offers would potentially be the programs that are in a more rural, small town location. Now, we know major metropolitan areas. New York City has a ton of programs. New York City has a ton of very competitive programs. I'm in central Pennsylvania. People have some preconceived notions about central Pennsylvania, but I'm in an academic institution <laughs> and we're actually suburban, but there are programs at even smaller geographic areas or more rural locations. And for those applicants that want to be in a small town or rural location, those programs that are in a similar location may actually look for that geographic preference. But honestly, if you don't have a geographic preference for the setting, it's okay letting that one go and saying you have no preference. Awesome. And then I think the final question was, I'm just getting to it from Mark. If I have a student that wants to apply to only one program in a geographic area, the other program she wants are in an adjoining area. She asked if she should signal both geographic areas in addition to the program that she wants. 100%. So if she utilize all three geo regions, there's no reason why you shouldn't, unless you're truly just not applying to three different geographic regions. If there are any programs, even one that's in another geo region, and you have the opportunity to, to put that in as a preference, put it in as a preference. Awesome. I think one more just popped up, and this will be our last question before we move on. If you did an extended rotation in a certain geographic region, would that count as a good reason for preferring it geographically, especially for IMGs? Yeah, I think you can have any reason and you have the opportunity to explain that. If you love that region, I think it's a perfect opportunity to kind of explain that and to show to a place like, hey, I've been here. I like this region. I'm looking in this region. Yeah, I think that's, you know, going back to what I said earlier about my favorite part with the GeoPress is that ability to explain the why. And if you're showing dedication to the area, you fell in love with it while you're there, use it as a selling point and, you know use it to your advantage. I don't see why you wouldn't maximize that opportunity. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. And if anyone has additional questions, you could send them in the chat and we'll see if there's time for them at the end. Yeah. And we'll try to breeze through the rest because I know that's not the, the main focus of this. I just want to comment on a couple things for experiences. So I know 
most of you don't know that this was changed uh, before you could list everything on your CV. You really have to choose 10 experiences now. From those 10, you can choose your three most meaningful. There's an expanded list of experience types that you can choose from. I wouldn't stress too much about the experience types. I don't think it really matters. Just choose whatever you think is most appropriate. One of the big things I do want to comment on is hobbies last year were included in your experiences. So happy to report that they've pulled that out again. So you no longer need to utilize one of your experiences to list your hobbies. You'll have 300 characters to kind of describe what your hobbies are. For each of your experiences, you can choose mission focus settings, focus areas, and key characteristics. Our guidance last year was to really try to choose from a wide variety to prevent you from being filtered out of consideration. But on analysis of what programs we're actually doing, nobody's using this as filters. So again, don't stress about this part. Just choose what you think fits best and move on. Your other impactful experience essay, we get a lot of questions about this. Should I fill it out? Should I not fill it out? This is a reminder. This is optional. This is really for those with hardships and challenges in route to residency. So what are some examples of that? Family background, maybe you're a first generation college graduate, financial background, perhaps you needed to work throughout high school, college, med school to support your family, community setting. Did you did you grow up with food scarcity, poverty, high crime rates? Did you have limited access to education? Or were there other general life circumstances that really impacted your journey? Like, did you lose a family member? Did you have a personal illness? Was there family illness? Did you have a caretaker role? These are the kinds of things that they're looking for. They're not looking for academic struggles in here because that is a little bit more of a common thing. They're really looking for those truly exceptional experiences that not a lot of people have experienced. In the first year, about 50% of applicants filled this out. We do not have data for this past year, but anecdotally, it seems like less people were filling out because I think people are getting the message that you don't need to fill this out. There's no expectation for that. So again, it's optional. How's this different from the personal statement? Obviously, that is required for everybody. I think the advantage of this impactful experience essay is it gives applicants the opportunity to use a separate section and not have to use their personal statement if they do have some of those experiences. So they can really focus on their personal statement as to like, why EM? Why am I a good fit for EM? What can I bring to the program? What, I look at? what am I looking for in a program? A few quick changes. We already talked about hometowns going from five to three. There are going to be more options for ethnicity to choose from. And then language fluency, changing a little bit, asking applicants to only list those that are good native or advanced speaking. So no basic languages. Should you be reporting only those where you're conversational in that language? Education section, there's going to be the movement of the awards into the education section. So IOA and Gold Humanism will be here now. Doesn't really matter for you guys. This is a little bit important for you to know extensions and interruptions. So in the past, any extension or interruption needed to be addressed in this section. They have now changed the wording to this, where they really only want you to focus on professionalism or academic issues. So they no longer want you to have to report any information about your health, your family status, or if you did something positive with that time off, like getting an extra degree. And then there's some extra questions surrounding, like, what did you learn from that experience? Because I think that's the most important thing for program directors. We'll kind of skip Q&A for that section and just leave an overall Q&A at the very end. We can probably breeze through the interview scheduling too. Yep, I'm going to go through this part really quick. What you need to know as applicants is that Thalamus is going to be the major player this application cycle. The AAMC announced a collaboration with Thalamus. And Eris used to have an Eris scheduling software. So you can see between Thalamus and the ARIS scheduler that we had in the past, emergency medicine was a high utilizer, almost 80% of programs. But with the collaboration and integration of the two and ARIS scheduling going away, that 50 and 31%, so about 80% of programs are probably going to be using Thalamus, if not more than that. But just to be aware that there are other scheduling platforms, Interview Broker, ResRate, Third Friday, and then some kind of like homegrown email apps or email processes from programs. Now, what you really need to know as an applicant regarding this, all Thalamus products are free to applicants. There will be Apple and Android app-based functions that are available. You could start inputting your data and setting up your accounts as of this past July, so last month. And then you can receive and respond to interview invitations directly through Thalamus. Now, 
we just want you to be aware of these other software programs or like the homegrown email stuff. You may want to consider keeping a separate calendar just to keep track of applications so you don't accidentally miss one or double book yourself if a program is not using Thalamus. And then just a quick refresher here of what the Eris residency timeline is. And we're kind of already only a month away from September 4th when applicants can begin submitting their applications. And then there's a, about a three week period of time where there's like a little layover and then programs cannot start accessing applications to review until September 25th. Please, please, please work on submitting your information early. I would save it as frequently as possible. I would not wait until September 24th at midnight. Oh, so thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Before it opens to um, programs, because it has been known to crash from time to time just because of the overwhelming volume of users. So work on getting your application information in as early as possible. And you can still make edits, just make sure that you hit save and, and get it ready before September 24th at midnight. And then match day is March 21st. All right. There's a lot of resources out there to help you guys with this. The WMC has their own website, the QR code here. They have an applicant worksheet, which is more helpful when the system isn't yet open. It's not open. You can just go in and see what's there. Court has our own website dedicated to this, as well as our own EM-specific guidance. So please take a look at our own EM-specific guidance. And then this is an important one for anybody who is out there and does not have access to an experienced emergency medicine advisor. Court can offer that to you for free through our distance advising program through the Advising Students Committee. So just email this address. We'll get you connected with somebody who is experienced in advising in EM who is up to date on all of the guidelines. Again, resources and questions. We'll leave this up. Probably have two minutes if we have one last minute question. Awesome. Last call for questions. Oh, we got one here. If you submit your application after September 4th, but before September 25th, does your application get pushed below the ones who submitted on the 4th? No, it doesn't matter what date within that time frame that you submit your application. The programs will see all of them at the same time. The one thing you don't want to do is submit it like the 25th at 9.01 because you better bet programs are there ready to download that data as soon as it opens to us. So just make sure it's in before that deadline. And as Liz said, typically crashes the night before. So maybe choose a couple days before to make sure everything is in. It all looks the same on the program side. Yep. Great. Any final questions that we have? I'm just going to talk because it's easier for me. So I'm part of program leadership but at a program and I'm a former IMG and I just wanted to just as a PSA to the other IMGs out there, you are allowed to have your own desires and opinions. And I think sometimes you feel that you can't because, you know, it is definitely statistically harder to match, but it's absolutely possible and it's okay to express your opinions and to put in your true desires when you're thinking about programs. Agree. And I think a really fabulous resource right now for our IMGs is the Residency Explorer tool. I'm not sure how much information it had before the most recent update, but it tells you the percentage of IMG applicants and the percentage of IMG residents for every single program. So I think that's huge to really help guide where you should be applying. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. So again, we want to give a huge, huge thanks to uh, Dr. Pelletier Bowie and Dr. Worley. This was, I know, a wealth of information for me, and I'm sure all of the other applicants who are on this call and all of the program leadership um, are going to have a lot to take away from this. And yeah, if you have questions, suggestions for future webinars from the RAM side or the CORD side, definitely feel free to reach out. And thanks so much for coming. Thanks for, thanks having, for having us. us. Thanks, everybody.